What's up guys? Welcome back to Storytime with Uncle Reddit. My name's John and this actually is going to be a start to a new series that I'm thinking about doing. Uh, we're going to try this out, see how you guys like it and uh, get your feedback. I'm going to keep it tech related, keep it on this channel, the Tales from Tech Support channel. We're going to talk about things that are historical, gadgets, the inventions and things that we use in, that are tech related every day that some people may know well about and some other people you know, use every day and don't give a second thought to. Now, I will admit right up front that I don't have any kind of teleprompter so that I can read in front of the camera very well. Uh, so I'm used to being able to look off camera to read my scripts and things that I type up. So this is going to be a little awkward for the first video, but we'll we'll see what we can make happen. At some point, I really need a real teleprompter, not a real like you know TV studio prompter, but something that keeps me focused more on you guys so that it's not quite so awkward. And I don't have a name for this playlist yet that we're creating on this channel. So any ideas that you guys have, feel free to toss your ideas out in the comments and uh, we'll see what we can come up with together. Thing number two that I will uh, admit to right up front, I'm not writing the entire script by myself. I'm, I'm getting help with my scripts. So I'm basically reading this for the first time, sort of, uh, just like you guys are hearing it for the first time. So bear with me while I work my way through this and, uh, Let's see what we can learn together. Today, I'd like to take you on a relatively short journey through time, exploring the fascinating history of what I would consider an essential device that many of us use every day, yet almost no one gives a second thought to. From its humble beginnings to its transformation into an indispensable tool for navigating the digital world, this is the story of the mouse. No, not that mouse. Our tale begins in the mid-1940s during the dawn of the computer age. As the need for more efficient human-to-computer interaction grew, visionary minds began exploring alternatives to existing input methods. Some of these previous methods of input were punch cards. Punch cards were one of the most common input methods before the mouse. They involved basically physically punching holes in cards according to specific instructions. These cards were then fed into the computer, allowing users to input data and execute commands. According to Wikipedia, punched cards were widely used through much of the 20th century in the data processing industry, where specialized in increasingly complex unit record machines organized into semi-automatic data processing systems used punched cards for that data input, output, and storage. These cards were actually used through the 1980s in some cases. Although punched cards were widely used, they had their limitations. The process of creating and using punched cards was time-consuming and required a certain level of technical expertise. It's funny, the only thing I can think of with punch cards, I never had any contact with anything punch card related, but uh, do you guys remember back to the 2000 elections where uh, in the state of Florida, we had a problem with chads? No, not that chad. I'm talking about the paper ballot chads where they were, you know, your vote was punched into the card. The biggest issue was hanging chads. Uh, so that was that was sort of t-shirt and bumper sticker worthy back then. And Florida basically had to do a total recount due to things like pregnant chads, hanging chads, swinging door chads. Oh my God. So does anybody else remember this from the year 2000? Next, there were light pens, another early input method developed in the late 1950s. A light pen consisted of a photosensitive device that could detect changes in light intensity. By pointing the pen at a cathode ray tube CRT display, users could interact with the computer by touching specific areas or selecting objects on that display. While light pens offered a more intuitive way to interact with computers, they were limited to working with screens that emitted light and required direct contact with the display surface. Then there were joysticks. Joysticks were primarily used in early video games, but also found in applications in some computer systems. These devices consisted of a stick-like lever that users could manipulate in different directions. The joystick provided a degree of analog control, allowing for more precise movements. Joysticks were useful for tasks that required continuous movement and direction orientation. However, their larger size and limited functionality made them less suitable for everyday computer tasks. I remember when I was a kid, we got our first game console. It was the, uh, the Atari 2600. Oh my God. We played on that thing for hours. We about wore out the floor of the carpet in front of the TV set, playing things like Space Invaders, Outlaw, Bowling, all kinds of stuff. Pac-Man. You know, we, we would sometimes even do the head-to-head -head stuff like, you know, tennis, where you had to use the paddle, which was the little turny wheelie thingy. And, uh, but we always really mostly played the joystick games. I spent so many hours playing that stuff that I'm pretty sure that's the reason for my bad wrists at this point and, uh, and my low grades in school at the time. Next, we have trackballs. Trackballs function similarly to the mouse, but with the mechanism inverted. 
Instead of moving the entire device like a mouse, users rolled a ball with their fingers or palm. This movement translated into on-screen cursor movements, enabling interaction with the computer. Trackballs were popular in certain applications, such as military and industrial systems, where a mouse's physical movement might be challenging or unsuitable. They offered precise control and didn't require much surface area like the mouse did. I absolutely despised trackballs. It started with when I was in the arcade, actually. There were certain games, I think Galaga was the one that really comes to mind where, you know, you're trying to real quick use the trackball and something about the space between the ball and the edge of the console table that you were rolling on, it would always pinch my fingers and my palms and I, I mean, I was an awkward kid, I'll admit it. You know, there was a lot of other kids that used them just fine and didn't get injured. So that may be a testament to my clumsiness, but either way, I just didn't find them very useful. Then I ended up getting one for my first Windows 95 PC, and it just seemed awkward. It wasn't intuitive. I put it right up there with the trackpad on laptops. I, I really have no patience or coordination or time for a trackpad nor a trackball. To me, a mouse is way more intuitive, and if I have the space, it's gonna be much more useful. If I'm on an airplane, fine, I'll deal with the trackpad, or I'll be on a tablet or my phone working, but uh, yeah. Now for military applications, I can see it because a lot of times guys that are using things with trackballs, we're sitting in a cramped trailer with a bank of computers or whatever, and you know, they're not gonna give you a big desktop like this where you can swing a mouse around. You're basically, at the limitations of whatever space you're in, whether it's a trailer, a submarine, uh, just a you know folding table in a tent with three other guys on the table with you, uh, it just you know I can see where that would be more practical, but not for me, kids. These are just a few examples of early input methods that were explored before the mouse took center stage. Each method had its own advantages and drawbacks, and the development of the mouse eventually brought a more intuitive and widely adopted solution to the world of human-to-computer interaction. In 1964, Douglas Engelbart, an esteemed computer scientist, is credited with inventing the mouse. In the early 1960s, Engelbart was working at the Augmentation Research Center at the Stanford Research Institute, where he dedicated his efforts to advancing human-to-computer interaction. Engelbart began brainstorming ideas for a device that could control the movement of the on-screen cursor or pointer. He wanted a tool that would be easy to use and offer precise control over the cursor's position. Although it looked quite different from the sleek devices we're familiar with today, it marked a major breakthrough in user interface technology. Engelbart's mouse was a wooden device with two wheels, aptly named the XY Position Indicator for a Display System. Man, that's a mouthful. Users could move the mouse across the table, and the cursor on the computer screen mirrored its movements. This novel concept paved the way for a revolutionizing computer interaction. And fun fact kids, which you probably already know, but the mouse got its name because of its shape, its size, and the fact that there was a wire hanging out of it which made it sort of look like a mouse with a long tail. In 1968, Engelbart and his team at ARC showcased their groundbreaking work, including the mouse, during a legendary event known as the Mother of All Demos. This demonstration presented numerous innovations that would shape the future of computing, and the mouse stole the spotlight with its intuitive and precise control mechanism. Fast forward to the 1980s, a decade that witnessed the rise of personal computing, big hair bands, and, regrettably, parachute pants. It was during this era that the humble computer mouse started gaining popularity with the introduction of one of the most iconic computers of all time, the Apple Macintosh. Apple's mouse featured a single button and became the standard for many years. However, it wasn't until the 1990s that the mouse truly entered the mainstream. With the advent of graphical user interfaces like Windows 95 and the World Wide Web, the mouse became an indispensable tool for navigating the digital landscape. Its widespread adoption led to major innovations in design and functionality. Now let's fast forward to present day. We have a vast array of mouse designs and features to choose from each design catering to diverse needs of its user, from traditional wired mice and wireless optical mice to gaming mice with programmable buttons and adjustable DPI. There truly is a mouse for everyone. On a side note, DPI stands for dots per inch or dots per linear inch, and is used to measure the sensitivity of a computer mouse's sensor. Alternative phrases such as CPI or counts per inch are used by some manufacturers. In either case, the DPI or CPI number describes how many pixels the cursor will move across the screen per inch of physical movement by the mouse. A higher DPI means the cursor will move faster and cover more screen distance with less physical movement. A lower DPI results in slower, more precise cursor movement. Put simply, DPI impacts sensitivity and speed. 
It can, however, become too much of a good thing, and most mice offer a maximum DPI setting that's well beyond what's useful in real-world gaming. I've messed with these settings in the past and soon realized that too much sensitivity makes the cursor super slow, not enough makes the cursor super fast and way less accurate, and almost impossible to keep track of on the screen, which makes my anxiety go right through the roof. So I keep it at a nice medium pace, just where I like to be. As technology continues to evolve at an ever-increasing pace, we're witnessing exciting developments in the world of mouse interfaces. Touch-sensitive surfaces, gesture recognition, and even voice-activated controls are becoming prominent features in the latest iterations of this beloved device. Looking into the future, one can't help but wonder what lies ahead for the mouse. With advancements in virtual and augmented reality, it's possible that the new forms of spatially aware input devices will change the way we interact with computers and digital environments. In the end, the humble mouse has come a long way from its less and streamlined wooden origins to becoming an essential part of our daily lives. It's played a pivotal role in shaping the way we navigate, interact, and unleash the full potential of our computers. I hope you guys enjoyed this brief glimpse into the history of the mouse, the invention of the mouse. If you'd like me to dive into more topics like this, if you got some inventions you want me to talk about, some other tech related things that you didn't know the origins of, or even if you do and you think other people would be interested in knowing, just uh, let me know down below and uh, we'll get it going. All right, guys, until the next one, we'll see you.